the Lord. We thank you for joining us on tonight, and we pray that you will share this video with your family and friends. Our scripture today will come from Psalm 50, verses 1 and 2 and verse 15. And it reads, The mighty one, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Verse 15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Praise God for his deliverance and us glorifying him. Susan Wallace from Brown Baptist Church in South Haven, Mississippi, sends me a devotional every day. And today she shared with me, pride is a tool of Satan. It can cause us to think that we don't need God's help and we are able to handle all of our difficulties. But we honor God when we give him the opportunity to display his mighty power. He wants us to ask for his help. He promised that he would deliver us if we turn to him. So when we face difficulties, when we remember that our wisdom, our resources, and our hard work cannot solve our problems, when we realize that, let us realize that. Let's call upon the Lord and wait with great expectation for him to rescue us. She goes on to say, Lord, we always need you. In times of distress, help us not, help us to let, not let pride rob us of your sufficiency. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Sister Wallace. Great work. Our song this morning, this evening is praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord.
and it's in the name of Jesus the Christ we come. God, we honor you. We praise you. We magnify you. Lord, we thank you for another privilege, another honor, another great opportunity to come before you. Lord, we bless your name, Father God. We, we bless you for you are worthy of all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Lord, you are worthy because you are the great God. You are a great king. You're the one who, who keeps us and blesses us. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to forgive us for our sins. Bless us, Father God, to re rely on you and you alone. Bless us, Lord, that we will be about your Father's business, our Father's business. That we, Father God, will be about doing those things that are pleasing in your sight. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we approach your word. Bless your word to jump off the page before us. And bless your word to have its way in our hearts and in our minds. Bless us tonight. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The sun goes down. Let everything, everything. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Thank God for another privilege, another honor to praise the Lord. Thank God for another chance just to be in front of you and uh, explaining the gospel good news of Jesus Christ. We are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, last week, we covered verses 1 through 4. This week, we will cover verses 5 through 7. Uh, we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, verses uh, 5 through 7 tonight. Last week, we covered verses 1 through, through 4. To bring those of you up to speed that were not with us last week, uh, Paul is writing this book to the church at Thessalonica. This book is known as Thessalonians. Thessalonians. The Apostle Paul is the author, the writer. Here he writes along uh, side uh, Silas and Timothy. He writes alongside Silas and Timothy. And throughout, throughout this book, you will find him saying we instead of I. So Paul writes this, this letter to, um, to the church at Thessalonica to the church called the Thessalonians. He writes this letter. He talks about the fact that I'm, I'm writing this letter in God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm writing this letter. He says grace to you and peace to you. He says in the name of the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes in verse number two and he talks about the fact that we thank God. We don't we don't cease, we don't fail thanking God always for you all. It says, I'm constantly thanking God for you. He goes further to say, mentioning you in our prayers. You ought to be mentioning somebody in your prayers other than you, yourself, and your family. You ought to be mentioning somebody in your prayers. Uh, for, the, for, for, for the first thing, you ought to be mentioning the saints of God. You ought to be mentioning your church family. You ought to be mentioning your neighbors in prayer. Paul says, I'm making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing how great works of faith you have been doing. I remember your labor of love. We are calling out you in prayer, thanking God for your works of faith, walking by faith, and your labor of love, doing great missionary works for others, and your patience in hope. Remember, this church is under great distress. This church is under persecution. This church is transforming from the old Jewish law to Christianity. So they are being persecuted. They are, they are being uh, uh, daggered in the back. They, they are being arrested. They are being killed because of their trust in Jesus Christ. So they have patience and hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. 
Then he closes verse number four by saying, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Meaning God has elected us, has chosen us. We didn't choose God. God has chosen us. Thank God that God has, has chosen us. Before the foundation of the world, God has chosen us. We are just participating in this story, this storyline that God has taken place. Someone would ask, well, why we got to go ahead and participate if God has already written the story? Because I want to be in included in the story as one that seeks God. And God doesn't have to seek after me because God has already sought us out. He has chosen us. And if he has chosen us, preach it, then why we got to confess him? Because God has given us a free moral agency. This free moral agency is our choice. We can choose freely who we want to serve. Thank God for not forcing us, binding us. We can choose freely who we want to serve. So this, this theory, this doctrine of election comes up in the fact that God has chosen us. God has chosen us as missionaries. God has chosen us as those who will walk with him and do his bidding for him. Amen? So now we find our way to verse number five. We're looking at verses five through seven of First Thessalonians chapter one. Verse number five says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. As you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. That's a whole lot of stuff. And if I was writing a paper today, the English language would call that a run-on sentence. <laughs> it's a run-on sentence. So let's break this run-on sentence down. Paul says, for our gospel. Let's stop to see what is he talking about, this our gospel. Remember, Paul is introducing this new thing called the gospel to the Jewish congregations. And here in this case, he is introducing the Thessalonians to this new gospel. It is a new gospel because they are transforming and trans being transported from the Old Testament Jewish worship style to worshiping Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, even in the old plan under the Old Testament, God had a plan by which he was able to reach mankind even before Jesus. But now Jesus ushers in and Paul reinstates this gospel here. He ushers in a new covenant. This covenant is one that says we have to love one another. So Paul says that we have brought unto you our gospel, the Christian gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he talks about our gospel. The word gospel means the good message, the good news. The word gospel means the good message or good tidings. We have enough bad news every day. Every single day, we have bad news. It's one thing about it, and now I see why. My dad and my granddad used to make it home every day, mm -hmm. and they would watch the evening news. Yeah. I don't know. I think it was Walter Conkright or somebody like that. They would watch the evening news. And now here I am at age 57, almost 58, two and a half years from 60. <laughs> and I'm rushing in at 5.30 to watch the evening news. Because what happens is the evening news sums up everything that has happened in the last 24 hours. And then a lot of people have just gotten off of work. And you can watch the evening news. And some people have gotten to the point where they don't watch news at all because it's all bad news. <laughs> and when you look at the evening news, it, it gives you in a capsule everything that's happened, not only in America, but all over the world. And as I watch the evening news, I find myself saying over and over and over again, Lord, have mercy. 
Lord have mercy. How would one with the right state of mind walk into a place where it, the place has people just going about their day shopping and don't stop shooting until 10 people are dead? A lot of emphasis is placed on the police officer that was killed. But there were other lives lost. And these were, at that moment, innocent people who had done nothing to him. And then police come to the rescue of those who have shot up a place, including those who have killed the person and many persons, and, and put bulletproof vests on them to protect them. People can walk into a church and kill nine people and just go on by their business and police officer put them on a bulletproof vest, stop by the nearest fast food restaurant and give them something to eat. When we know if it happens in our community with one of us, we are dead on arrival. We need good news. Paul says, our news is good news. He says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only. The gospel is the word of God. The gospel is the spoken word, how we speak the word of God, how we allow God to use us to deliver the word of God. We need to do more of speaking God's word. Instead of you patting your friend on the back when he or she goes wrong, <laughs> You need to make sure you deliver some good news and the gospel is good news. Paul says, we have delivered unto you our gospel. Now, don't get it twisted. It's not Paul's gospel. It's not Silas' gospel. It's not Peter's gospel. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it calls our attention now to the fact that we got to stop presenting ourselves as good news. We must present Jesus Christ and his good news. We must continue to present Jesus Christ because there's no news better than the good news of Jesus dying on Calvary and rising early that third day morning. When I was a boy, I used to wonder why, why, how the, the, the late R.L. Reed and the late uh, Pastor uh, Billy Love, would when they come to the end of their message, they would always go to the cross. Because regardless of how dark and dismal their messages were from, from the front to the end, they will always close out with the fact that there's good news. Yes. The good news for a sin-sick soul is the fact that Jesus died on Calvary. Amen. An innocent man died for guilty men and women. Mm -hmm. An innocent man died for boys and girls, for self-righteous people. A innocent man died for them. So Paul says that we have come with our gospel. And when he's saying this, I had to take a second look because I know that it's not his gospel. Mm -hmm. I know it's that it's not Silas' gospel. I know that it's not Timothy's gospel. Yes. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. But what he was saying is we're ushering in this New Testament gospel. And as we go through these few verses, we, you will find out why he identifies it as our gospel. He says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only. It did not come to you just with the word only. Our gospel, and Paul has preached for some three weeks here, and he is slowly feeding them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just share with you. Sometimes you can't dump a truckload <laughs> all at one time when you're teaching and when you're preaching. We were missionaries to Brazil. My wife and I and several others from Houston were missionaries to Brazil for about five years. We would go on short-term mission trip, four to, to, to seven days mission trips. And when we went to Jeremawaba, which is back in the, the villages of 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 Brazil, we would go to Jeremawaba, and when we got to Jeremawaba, we could not talk to them about Jesus on our first trip. Mm -hmm. Our first trip, we just talked about nature 
in general revelation and how God has, the God that's put all this stuff that you see together. And right, right around our third trip, we were able to talk about a lamb. We were able to talk about an escape goat, a scapegoat. And we talked about the scapegoat because they could identify with animals. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about the scapegoat. And what we did was we said that the priests of the Old Testament would lay his hands on the scapegoat, on the head, the head of a goat. And this goat would take off running through the woods. He was known as a scapegoat. He would take the sins. It was identifying them with the sins of their lives. This scapegoat would take the sins of mankind and run away into the wilderness. It was identifying the sins of mankind being carried away by one goat. The next trip, we were able to talk about the scapegoat and talk about the fact that Jesus Christ is the scapegoat. You know, on your job, you, you may have been used as a scapegoat. I've been used several times as a scapegoat. The scapegoat is an innocent person that they force to say that he's guilty or they say that he's guilty and condemn him as if he's guilty. I've been the scapegoat so many times. I mean, I've been the scapegoat so many times. And, and people, even in churches, will use you as a scapegoat. They will say you were guilty when they were guilty. So Jesus Christ has become the scapegoat for all of mankind. God has placed sin on Jesus. Yeah. Jesus has become our scapegoat. Jesus hung on a cross. Yeah. Jesus was killed by mean men. Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. And Jesus rose from the dead for us, not for himself. He became our scapegoat. And since Jesus is now our scapegoat, now we have a right to the tree of life. So Paul comes preaching this gospel, teaching this gospel. Silas and, and Timothy, is, they are preaching and teaching this gospel. He says, for our gospel did not come in word only. He said it didn't come just in mere words. You know, there are some people who are rhetoricians. There are some people who are word, wordly. They have a lot of words. But really, those words are like tingling symbols. <laughs> They're, those words are like bouncing ping pong balls off the wall when it comes to prayers. Some of you can, can pray and, or you can listen to somebody else pray. And you can tell what their prayer is going to sound like because they're going to pray the same prayer over and over again. Let me just share with you. Don't, don't be a tingling symbol. Make your words count. And some people, some people are like, when they're talking, their words are like dripping faucet. And it's just annoying. I told you before, we were loading the truck and unloading the truck, and we were doing a mission, and, and this lady just kept talking, kept talking, kept talking, and all of a sudden, I was so glad she asked me. I, I didn't want to tell another man's wife to stop talking. She just kept talking. She meant well, but her words meant nothing. She was just talking. So after a while, she finally asked me, and I got a chance to tell her. She said, Pastor, what do you want from us? I was so glad she asked that question. The moment she asked the question, I said, I want silence. I want you to stop talking. That's what I was really saying. I want silence. So she got it. She got it. She stopped talking. Because some people are just wordy. And their words are nothing. Paul says, we didn't come to you with this gospel in words only. We didn't just have word only, yes. but also the power in, in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. Paul knows that I can stand here and talk to you all night, yes. 
But if I do not understand or operate in the anointing of God, if I do not operate in the Holy Spirit of God, then I won't get through. Yes. Paul says, when you speak, God wants you to have power. When you deliver the good news, God wants you to have power. When you're talking to somebody about Jesus Christ, God wants you and your words to have power. And God knows and God tells us and God shares with us the fact that the Holy Spirit is the person who gives us power. Yes, Lord. You see, we can talk about Jesus, we can present the gospel, but unless the Holy Spirit draws one, we will never get men to come to Christ. That's why it's so important for us to pray. We, we have to pray, Lord, Lord, give us the Holy Spirit in leadership of us. Lord, bless the Holy Spirit to bless our words. Amen. Lord, bless us by way of your Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune God. He's the third person of the Trinity. He is a person. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is the third person of the Godhead. And so the Holy Spirit doesn't walk around hitting you either. Boy, when the Holy Spirit hit me, no, the Holy Spirit didn't hit you. The Holy Spirit comes in when we receive Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. Boy, that Holy Spirit came through man and that Holy Spirit hit me. No, the Holy Spirit didn't hit you. When you're saved, when you're born again, the Holy Spirit resides. Songwriters were right. The songwriter says, he walks with me. He talks with me. And he tells me that I'm his own. So get it right. It's the Holy, he, he is the Holy Spirit, not it the Holy Spirit. He the Holy Spirit. So Paul understands here that when we speak words, when we write words, when we live words, the Holy Spirit allows the conviction to come upon man's kind's heart by way of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Our words are only convicting. Our words are only convincing. Our words are only converting when they are laced with the Holy Spirit. Yes. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God himself, the Holy Spirit. And then he says, our words came with power. Our words came by in the Holy Spirit. And he says, and my words, came, our words came with much assurance. Mm -hmm. Came with entire confidence. This word assurance is entire confidence. This word assurance is confidence beyond measure. Confidence that we couldn't even think about. Confidence that we couldn't even dream about. We have confidence that the word of God is going forth. We have confidence that the Holy Spirit will grant us power. And we have confidence that the word of God will go forward and it will do what God promised it would do. We have to stop using our words and use God's words. Yes. If one thing that makes a parent happy is that when a parent hears a child using his or her words. Oftentimes tells a story at the age of three, I had taught my daughter the difference between an insect and a bug. And I could hear her outside arguing with one of her friends. That's not a bug, that's an insect. Mm -hmm. Well, to little children, three and four year olds, everything is a bug. Yes. But my daughter had to tell her that, that that's an insect. So, well, how you know it's an insect? It's because my daddy told me it was an insect. Mm -hmm. See, look at the body parts. It's three. Okay. Look at the set of legs. There are three sets. It's an insect. And boy, I mean, you're talking about my chest sticking out. 
Because I heard my child repeating my words. That means my child was convicted, even at the age of three, was convicted by my words. What if we had the assurance from God and God had the assurance in us that we would speak his word just the way he says it? And we won't sugarcoat it and, and we won't change it. We won't add to it. We won't take away from it. It's God's word. Stick with God's word. I'm going to tell you something. I, I oftentimes hear preachers preaching and they're lying on God. Because they're not delivering God's word the way God said it. And whenever you don't do your study... <laughs> Whenever you don't do your, your word study, whenever you don't do the justice, of the, the text justice, then you're lying on God. Because if God didn't say it, you're lying on him. Yeah. He says that our word came with much assurance. Our word came with much assurance through what God was really trying to say to us. Assurance, the entire confidence. As you know what kind of men we were, you knew you could depend on us. You knew we were walking with God. The other thing that you need to understand, people are dependent on our character. As we speak to them, we are, we are to be so squeaky clean. Now I just messed up. We are to be so squeaky clean that people don't think about other things while we're standing. What are you talking about, preacher? Well, I messed up. I've fallen short. I've been forgiven. And I'm asking you to forgive me too. But you ought not, every time I stand up, think about where my sin is. Or where my sin has been. So in other words, we have to understand that people are looking to see what kind of men we are. What kind of women we are. What kind of children we are. People are watching us. They're looking for us to imitate Jesus Christ. So we ought to be imitators of Christ. So he, Paul says to them at the, at the church at Thessalonica that, that you knew what kind of men we were. And because you knew what kind of men we, we were, we were among you for your sake. In other words, we're bringing you the gospel. And this gospel is going to be a benefit to you as it has been a benefit to us. Men, women, boys, and girls need to always deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to always tell men, women, boys, and girls, your friends, your buddies, and your foes about the gospel of Jesus Christ. People ought to identify you as one that's always sharing. I tell you, I tell you the truth, if you cut me, out of my DNA will flow evangelism and discipleship. Mm -hmm. If you are cut, what will flow from your DNA? Mm -hmm. What will come out of you? If God was to take a scalpel and cut you, will cussing come out? Will prayer come out? Will praises come out? Let me tell you, sometime I, I, it's time for me to go to bed and I, and I lay down, and, and, and some of you, I know some of y'all are real sanctified and real holy, but uh, sometime I can lay down and all I can say, Lord, thank you. Yes. Lord, thank you that I made another day. Lord, thank you that you helped me as I went through the day. Sometime I don't have time to say, Lord, here it is. I don't even feel like it. Have you ever been to a point in your life where you were in so much pain that you couldn't even pray? That's when the Holy Spirit makes connection for you. Yes. Now, I didn't say you ought to stop praying. I'm saying that there will be some situations that you'll put in. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will make supplication for you, mm -hmm. make utterance for you. The Holy Spirit will. The Holy Spirit, he will. So Paul says, Y'all knew what kind of people we were. You knew what kind of men we were. And you knew we were there for your sake. Verse number six. And you became followers of us and of, of the Lord. Let me tell you, when people are looking for something, they ought to find Christians. They ought to find Christians that they can follow. This world is full of a ball of confusion and it's only because 
People are looking for something and somebody they can follow. They're looking for godly examples. Even the worst hypocrite is looking for godly example. Even the worst sinner is looking for a godly example. They're looking for something. Paul says, you knew what kind of people we were. And you became followers of us and followers of the Lord. Paul says, you begin to follow us. You begin to look at us because you saw Jesus in us. Paul says, not only did you follow us, you began to follow the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now look at the, the way he lays this out. He says, first of all, you followed us. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you followed the Lord. Could he be saying that you followed the Lord because you were able to follow us? There are some godly examples that have been placed in, in my midst. And in the midst of following those godly examples, I carry myself as I do because of those godly examples. Paul says, and you became followers of us and you became followers of the Lord, having received the, received the word in much affliction. I told you this church was under persecution. But they received the word in the midst of affliction. Lord, deliver me from the church that any little thing can wipe them out. We can go wherever we want to go. We can listen to whoever we want to listen to. And many of us don't take those benefits. Matter of fact, we take those benefits for granted. Mm -hmm. We don't get arrested when we go to church just because we go to that church. Paul says to this church at Thessalonica, you received the word in much affliction. He says, you looked to us and we gave you a godly example. We were mimicking, imitating Jesus Christ. And then you not only followed us, but you followed the Lord also, Jesus Christ himself. You received the word in much affliction. You received the word while you were being persecuted and you received the word in the midst of your ailment. Your ailment is things, that, that's things that's going on around you. There are things that, are, that could really hinder you. You received the word under this great tribulation. You received the word while you were burdened. You received the word while you were in trouble. Some people will go out of their way to receive the word and they won't let anything turn them around. I hate listening to the news on Friday and Saturdays. I hate listening to the weather on Friday and Saturday because I know Sunday morning is going to be, be short if the weatherman says Friday, Saturday, and Sunday there's going to be some weather. The problem I have is the weatherman can say it's going to be storming on Friday, but you do, your, do what you do on Friday. The weatherman says it's going to be storming on Saturday, and you do whatever you do on Saturday. And then you want to use the excuse, Sunday is the Lord's day, so the Lord rests on the seventh day. So folks, stay at home on Sunday. If it says, if it says, I didn't say a drop of rain falls. If the if if the if the if the meteorologists say it's gonna rain, they stay at home. But I thank God that the weatherman, mm. God Himself, is the one who determines if it's gonna rain. Yeah. If the meteorologist said it's gonna rain and he cannot designate the time, God Himself knows how to designate the exact time. Some people can't go through any affliction. They can't go through trouble. They, they can't put up with God and God folk. And they, they can't put up with any pressure. This word affliction means pressure. This word affliction means trouble. This word affliction means tribulation. This, this word affliction means, means that you're going through great persecution. Are you going through persecution for anything? Are you able to just say, I ain't doing that? I ain't, I ain't doing it. Now. Forget old Rev. Let him go down there. He and his wife show up. That's fine. Let me just share with you today. This church at Thessalonica, 
they received the word of God and they didn't have Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. They didn't have Zoom. They didn't have software, uh, Microsoft, uh, anything like that, uh, 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 meetings or, or something of that nature. They showed up in great persecution when they knew the police and the National Guard was going to kill them. They showed up to hear the word. He said, not only did you receive the word in much persecution, with joy of the Holy Spirit, you received the word. You had great joy. You had great joy. I know the police is waiting on us out here when we get out of here. I know we're going to jail for listening to this word. I know this gospel is a good gospel, but I know they're going to put us in prison, and I know that some of us going to get killed, but we're going to receive this word with the power and with the anointing and the joy of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Will you receive him with the joy of the Holy Spirit? Will, will you go out of your way to hear the word? We are doing Bible listening now. We're doing it for the whole year. We're listening to the word of God every day based on the schedule. We're, we're on schedule. We, and those of you who are not on schedule, catch up. Get back in the race. Don't back out. It's not too hard. I'm not asking you to read through the scripture. I'm asking you to listen to the scripture and journal it down, write it down. And then we have our daily reading, which is only a few verses. And we need to do it every day because we are not under persecution. We just busy doing other stuff. If you're too busy for God, you're too busy. If you're too busy for the word, you're too busy because you need to receive the word with yes. the joy of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Verse number seven. He says to this church at Thessalonica, so that you became examples. You became examples to all of Macedonia and all Arcadia who believe. It says, you followed us. You followed the Lord. You received the word. You imitated Jesus Christ. You followed us and followed the Lord. You followed Jesus Christ to the point where you became godly examples. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. Somebody's watching you. And they're looking at how you're going to handle this situation. They're looking at how you're going to handle death. They're looking at how you're going to handle, handle the pandemic. They're looking at how you're going to how you're going to handle people shutting doors in your face. They're looking at how you handle unemployment. They're looking at how you're handling your family life. They're looking at how you handle divorce. They're looking at how you're handling your own personal sickness. People are watching you and they're looking for you to rise with the testimony so they can have a testimony. He says you became examples. And you didn't come, become examples just to the people in your house. Not just to the people in your city, but you became examples to Macedonians, mm -hmm. to Acadians. You became examples to them who believe. What he says now, he, he, he closes this out in verse number seven by saying, you were such an example to other folk believe. Yeah. It, it, is, it, is known, it is known as lifestyle evangelism. This lifestyle evangelism is when other people watch you and become like you. The, the disciple, this is my own personal statement, my own personal conviction, my own personal belief. I believe that when the, when the disciple matures, he will be better than his teacher. I believe when the disciple matures, he will be better than the one he's following. I believe when the disciple matures, then the disciple will be a blessing to others far greater than he is or her teacher was. They became examples to all who would believe. They became examples to everybody who saw them. And let me tell you, everybody who hears your words Everybody who's, who understand you, everybody who know you're right when you're walking with God, they will not become disciples, but there's one thing about it, they will know you're real. Right. 
You just continue to be a godly example. As you are a godly example, then people will follow you. People will follow you in such a way that they will look at you and say, wow. And it's not about you. It's about the deliverance that they have through Jesus Christ because they watched you. Yes. Paul says to this church at Thessalonica that, that you, have, you have been godly examples. And because you have been godly examples, others believe. Not only do they believe in Thessalonica, they believe in Macedonia. They believe in Arcadia. People believe now because you walked in the word. People believe because people have been godly example down through the years. Thank God for the saints of God that have been blessings in my life, that have been godly examples. I pray because I've seen others pray. I'm able to stand under pressure because I've seen others stand under pressure. I'm able to speak my peace because I've seen others speak their peace. That's why I never be a politician. I can't be. A, they asked me to be on the board of directors, uh, the board, the school board for Fort Bend County. I can't do it because I can't. I can't deal with the politics. I, I got to say what I have to say. I have to be an example to the children. And when the children ask me, "Well, where did you stand when these things were going on?" I'm gonna tell them where I stood. Mm -hmm. I have to be a godly example. Yes. And if they don't receive me, that's okay. I have to be an example for others to be saved, for others to believe. Will you be an example for others to believe? Tonight, this is an opportunity if you haven't believed. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity for you to believe in what Paul calls our gospel. It's an opportunity for you to believe that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a skull hill called Calvary. It is an opportunity for you to believe that Jesus became our scapegoat. He became an innocent man taking on all of our sins. And he took, just like a scapegoat, he took our sins and ran off into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. But what Jesus did, he took our sins and, and hung on a cross. The Bible says if you believe the story that Jesus died for your sins, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. Early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. You can be saved right here, right now. Will you join me in going to heaven? Will you join me in living for the Lord? Will you join me in doing those things that, that will bless others? Will you join me in being a godly example for others to see? This is your moment. You can get to know Jesus. All you have to do is repeat after me in this little simple prayer and invite him into your life. And we believe that you can be saved right here today. Verse number seven, First Thessalonians chapter one, verse number seven says that they were examples to all who believe. It's in the text. Will you believe today? Will you believe the simple story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for you and for me? He died on a skull hill called Calvary. He voluntarily became the scapegoat. He voluntarily gave his life for you and me. Mean men killed him. And after he was dead, they pierced him in his side. Out of his side flew, flowed blood and water. The blood was for the sanctifying of the nation, of the entire world. If you can believe the story, you can receive Jesus Christ. After they pierced him in his side, it proved that he was already dead. After they pierced him in his side, they took him down off the cross, laid him in a borrowed tomb. Early that third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. This word rose in the Greek means to arouse. When we use it in today's language, this word arouse means to wake one up from sleep. But when we talk about Jesus, he was aroused, woken up. He was awakened from death. He got up for you and for me, for power, for strength in the Holy Spirit. Will you join me and invite him into your life today? Trust Jesus as your Savior. Just bow your head with me and repeat after me this simple prayer. 
Repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. Now come into my life. And make me a new person. And make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus, name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe that you prayed this prayer. You're now born again. We believe that you're on your way to heaven when you die. And there will be others of you who have already invited Christ in. You're already saved. And if you've ever been saved, you're still saved. Trusting in Jesus, you're still saved. But maybe you've gotten thrown off. Maybe you turn your back against God. Maybe you've fallen short. I mess up. I'm still messing up. I want to say to you today, get back on. Get back on. Get back up. Trust Jesus. Repent of your sins. Rededicate. Recommit to God today. I want to pray for you and ask God to come back and, and lift you by way of your Holy, with His Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask you to bless those who have walked away from who have walked walked away from you, who have walked away from the church, who have walked away from your their commitment to you. Bless them, Father God, to walk with you and turn them around, Lord. Give them another chance and bless them, Father God, to to stick with you. That you will continue to bless them and give them godly examples that they can follow somebody lead them in the right direction. Give them a pastor who has God on their heart. Give them a church that will love them to Christ. Give them family members and friends that will encourage them to stay with Jesus. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. And if you're listening to this broadcast and you're in between church or you don't have a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain of the ship, where Jesus is the center of attention, where Jesus is the main attraction. Whether you're here locally in Houston or you're anywhere over this world, you can join the New Beginning Church. If you want to join our church, inbox me and let me know and I'll be glad to welcome you to this family of faith. If you receive Christ tonight, Inbox me and let me know. I want to rejoice with you. If you rededicated tonight and, and you really want to get to know Jesus and grow in faith and grow in spirit, inbox me and let me know. I want to encourage you and walk with you. Will you do that for me today? Thank you again for joining us here at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Shiremai Road, Houston, Texas. Thank you for being a part of our service. We're back in the sanctuary now and we have room. We have room for all of those who feel comfortable to come and be a part of our service. Our service time is 10.30 a.m. Our broadcast time is 10.45. So please, ma'am, please, sir, continue to, to listen and be a part of our broadcast. And also those of you who want to come and sit and worship together. We have COVID-19 protocols in place. We will have tracing going on. So when you go in and come in, you, your temperature has to be checked. Your, your phone number is given. And it's recorded right along with your name. We're asking you to keep mask on and doing the worship service. We're asking you not to congregate or, or hug each other. We'll get to that soon enough. But come on and be a part of our service on Sunday morning at 1030 and at 10.45 on our live broadcast. It is now time for offering. Please, ma'am, please, sir, come be a part of our giving. It is offering time. It is offering time. It is offering time. You can give. We, pr we prefer that you give by way of Zelle or by way of P.O. Box. It is offering time. It's time for us to give. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. 
dot Jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting dot Jesus at yahoo.com. Our P.O. Box is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. And for those of you who have not made the transfer from Cash App to Zelle, we're giving you a little more time to make that transfer. We want you to make that transfer from Cash App to Zelle or to the P.O. Box. Please, ma'am, please, sir. Our Cash App account is dollar signs NBC Soul, dollar sign NBC Souls. That's uh, cash tag NBC Souls. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Uh, please continue to be a part of our Wednesday night service at 7.20 p.m. And a part of our Sunday morning Sunday school at 9 o'clock a.m. And our live broadcast is worship service is at 10.45 a.m. We're looking forward to uh, welcoming you to our parking lot service. Our parking lot service for Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection Sunday, our parking lot service will begin at 10.30 a.m. Parking lot service. Come one, come all to the New Beginning Church for our parking lot service. For our parking lot service on uh, April the 4th. That is Resurrection Sunday. April the 4th. We'll be glad to have you a part of our parking lot service. Looking forward to a great time. Our, our last parking lot service was at, at uh, Resurrection Sunday this time last year. So come on back and be a part of it. Right around the cross, right around the cross. We have a 50-foot cross standing right there in our front yard. We want to park right around that cross and, and worship the Lord with power, with strength, with conviction. Come on, be a part. We're also lifting up the Whitlock family and the Wallace family. And in their moment of bereavement, we want to lift, lift them before the Lord, the Whitlock family and the Wallace family. Uh, before the Lord in this moment of bereavement. And thank you so much for being a part of our, our live broadcast on last night as we did a virtual spring revival for the Holy Trinity Church. Thank all of you for being a part of that virtual revival. We're doing things differently. We're in a new season. Amen. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. We here at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12, 32. Father God, we thank you. We bless you. We glorify you. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another chance to honor you, Father God. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us and be godly examples. Bless us, Father God, that we will walk with you. Bless us that we will listen to this gospel, follow this gospel, obey, the, obey this gospel, and follow godly examples as we walk in this gospel. We pray, Father God, that you remind us of who Jesus is, what he has done. Remind us of who the Holy Spirit is and how he continues to bless us. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. God bless you. And God keep you is our prayer.